So this is extract 18 of Terry Pratchett's Truckers. The stars. A long, long time ago, gnomes had travelled between them and things that made lorries look tiny and that had been built by gnomes. And one of the great ships exploring round a little star on the edge of nowhere had sent out a smaller ship to land on the world of humans. But something had gone wrong. Maskin hadn't understood that bit very much, except that the thing that moved the ships was very, very powerful. Hundreds of gnomes had survived, though. One of them, searching through the wreckage, had found the thing. It wasn't any good without electricity to eat, but the gnomes had kept it, nevertheless, because it had been the machine that steered the ship. And the generations had passed by, and the gnomes forgot everything except that the thing was very important. That was enough for one head to carry, Masculine thought. But it wasn't the most important bit. It wasn't the bit that made his blood fizz and his fingers tingle. This was the important bit. The big ship, the one that could fly between stars, was still up there somewhere. It was tended by machines like the thing, patiently waiting for the gnomes to come back. Time meant nothing to them. There were machines to sweep the long corridors, and machines that made food, and watched the stars, and patiently counted the hours and the minutes in the long, dark emptiness of the ship. And they wait forever. They didn't know what time was, except something to be counted and filed away. They'd wait until the sun went cold and the moon died, carefully repairing the ship and keeping it ready for the gnomes to come back, to take them home. And while they waited, Masklin thought, we forgot all about them. We forgot everything about ourselves. We lived in holes in the ground. He knew what he had to do. It was, of course, an impossible task, but he was used to them. Dragging a rat all the way from the woods to the hole had been an impossible task. But it wasn't impossible to drag it a little way. So you did that. And then you had a rest. And then you dragged it a little way again. The way to deal with an impossible task was to chop it down into a number of merely very difficult tasks and break each one of them into a group of horribly hard tasks and each one of them into tricky jobs and each one of them into... and so on. Probably the hardest job of all was to make gnomes understand what they once were and could be again. He did have a plan. Well, it had started off as the thing's plan, but he turned it over and over in his mind so much that it felt now like it belonged to him. It was probably an impossible plan, but he'd never know unless he tried it. Gerda was still watching him cautiously. Um, said Masklin, this plan? Yes, said Gerda. The abbot told me that the stationary have always tried to make gnomes work together and stop squabbling, said Maskin. That has always been our desire, yes. This plan will mean that they have to work together. Good. Only, I don't think you're going to like it much, said Maskin. That's unfair. How can you make assumptions like that? I think you'll laugh at it, said Masklin. The only way to find out is to tell me, said Gerda. Masklin told him. When Gerda was over the shock, he laughed and he laughed. And then he looked at Masklin's face and stopped. You're not serious, he said. Let me put it like this, said Masklin. Have you got a better plan? Will you support me? But how will you, how can those, it, is it even possible that we can't? Gerda began. We'll find a way, said Masklin. With Arnold Brothers established 1905's help, of course, he added diplomatically. Oh, of course, said Gerda weakly. And then he pulled himself together. Anyway, if I'm to be the new abbot, I, I have to make a speech, he said. It, it's expected. 
general messages of goodwill and so on. We can talk about this later, reflect upon it at leisure in the sober surroundings of... Maskin shook his head. Gerda swallowed. You mean now, he said. Yes. Now. We tell them now. Extract from the Book of Gnome, third floor, verses one to nine. And the leaders of the gnomes were assembled, and the abbot Gerda said unto them, Hearken to the words of the outsider. And some waxed wroth, saying, He is an outsider. Wherefore then shall we hearken unto him? The abbot Gerda said, Because the old abbot wished it so, and yea, because I wish it so also. Whereupon they grumbled and were silent. The outsider said, concerning the rumours of demolition, I have a plan. Let us not go like woodlice fleeing from an overturned log, but like brave free people at a time of our choosing. And they interrupted him, saying, What's woodlice? Whereupon the outsider said, All right, rats. Let us take with us the things that we need to begin our life anew outside, not in some other store, but under the sky. Let us take all gnomes, the aged and the young, and all the food and materials and information that we need. And they said all, and he said all. And they said unto him, We cannot do this thing. Yes, we can, said Maskin, if we steal a lorry. There was dead silence. The Count de Ironmongery raised an eyebrow. The big smelly things with wheels at each corner, he said. Yes, said Maskin. All eyes were on him. He felt himself beginning to blush. The gnome's a fool, snapped the Duke de Haberdashery. Even if a store was in danger, I see no reason, no reason, I say, to believe it. The idea is quite preposterous. You see, said Maskin, beginning to blush more, there's plenty of room. We can take everything. We can steal books that tell us how to do things. The mouth moves, the tongue waggles, but no sense comes out of it, said the Duke. <laughs> there was nervous laughter from some of the gnomes around him. Out of the corner of his eye, Maskin saw Angelo shining by his father, his face shining. No offence to the late abbot, said one of the lesser lords, hesitantly, but I've heard that there are other stores out there. I mean to say, we must have lived somewhere before the store, he swallowed. What I'm getting at is, if the store was built in 1905, where did we live in 1904, eh? No offence meant. I'm not talking about going to another store, said Masculin. I'm talking about living free. And I'm listening to no more of this nonsense. The old abbot was a sound man. But he must have got a little funny in the head at the finish, snapped the Duke. He turned and stormed out, noisily. Most of the other lords followed him, some of them quite reluctantly, Maskell noticed. In fact, a few hung around at the back so that if asked, they could say they were just about to leave. Those left were the Count, a small fat woman who Gerda had identified as the Baroness del Icatessen, and a handful of lesser lords from the sub-departments. The Count looked around theatrically. Ah, he said, room to breathe. Carry on, young man. Well, that's about it, Masculine admitted. I, I can't plan anything more until I've found out more things. For example, can you make electric? Not steal it from the store, but, but make it. The Count stroked his chin. You are asking me to give you department secrets, he said. My lord, said Gerda, sharply. If we take this desperate step, it is vital that we are open with one another and share our knowledge. That's true, said Masculin. Quite, said Gerda sternly. We must all act for the good of all gnomes. Well said, said Masculin. And that's why the stationery, for their part, will teach all gnomes who request it to read. There was a pause. It was broken by the faint wheezing noise of Gerda trying not to choke. To read, he began. Maskin hesitated. Well, he'd gone this far. Might as well get it over with. He saw Grimmer staring at him. 
Women too, he said. This time it was a count who looked surprised. The Baroness, on the other hand, was smiling. Good, it was still making little mewling noises. There's all kinds of books on the shelf in the stationery department, Masculine plunged on. Anything we want to do, there's a book that tells us how. But we're going to need lots of people to read them so we can find out what we need. I think our stationary friend would like a drink of water, observed the Count. I think he may be overcome by the new spirit of sharing and cooperation. Young man, said the Baroness, what you say might be true. But do these precious books tell us how one may control one of these lorry things? Masklin nodded. He had been ready for this one. Grimmer came up behind him, dragging a thin book that was nearly as big as she was. Maskin helped her prop it up so they could all see it. See? It's got words on it, he said proudly, and I've learnt them already. They say, <coughs> and he pointed each one out with his spear as he said them, the highway code. Highway code. It's got pictures inside. When you learn the highway code, you can drive. It says so. Highway code, he said un uncertainly. And I've been working out what some of the words mean, said Grimmer. And she's been reading some of the words, Maskin agreed. He couldn't help noticing that this fact interested the Baroness. What is the... Is it, and it, that is all there is to it, said the Count. Uh, said Maskin. He'd been worrying about this himself. He, he had an obscure feeling that it couldn't be as easy as all that. But this was no time to worry about details that could be sorted out later. What was it the abbot had said? The important thing about being a leader was not so much being right or wrong, but being certain. Being right helped, of course. Well, I went and looked in the lorry nest, and I mean the garage, this morning, he said. And you can see inside them, if you climb up, there's levers and wheels and things. But I suppose we can find out what they do. He took a deep breath. It can't be that difficult. Otherwise, humans wouldn't be able to do it. The gnomes had to concede this. Most intriguing, said the Count. May I ask what it is you require from us now? People, said Masklin simply. As many as you can spare, especially the ones you can't spare. And they'll need to be fed. The Baroness glanced at the Count and he nodded, so she nodded. I'd just like to ask the young girl, she said, whether she feels all right with this reading, I mean. I can only do some words, said Grimmer quickly, like left and right and bicycle. And you haven't experienced any feelings of pressure in the head, said the Baroness, carefully. Not really, ma'am. Hmm. That's extremely interesting, said the Baroness, staring fixedly at Gerda. The new abbot was sitting now, down now, uh, he began, Masklin groaned inwardly. He thought it would be difficult, learning to drive, learning how a lorry worked, learning to read, but they were, they were just tasks. You could see all the difficulties before you started. If you worked at them for long enough, then you were bound to succeed. He'd been right. The difficult thing was going to be all the people. <laughs>